Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton freshman Neil Reddy, and I'm so excited to welcome Ramesh Panuru to the show. Ramesh is a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, senior editor with the National Review, and a visiting fellow for the American Enterprise Institute. A leading conservative thinker and pundit, Ramesh has made numerous appearances on shows like Meet the Press and Face the Nation. He's also an alumnus of Princeton, earning a degree in history. So with that, I'd like to once again, welcome Ramesh to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so I guess we could start the interview by talking a little bit more about how you kind of found your footing as a conservative commentator, maybe dating back to your time at Princeton. How did you develop this sort of philosophy and your, your principles like as a conservative thinker? And how did your time at Princeton kind of influence that? So I actually started writing conservative commentary in high school. I, um, uh, there was a concern, uh, at the risk of going into too much detail, there was a, uh, there was a conservative underground paper in my um, high school and uh, that some of my friends did. And then I um, started a, uh, a liberal um, one, uh, but, uh, at, but as I, I, you know, I was always interested in politics and uh, current events. And as I, I read more, I uh, moved right pretty rapidly. Um, I was uh, I was reading The Economist back then and uh, and it uh, inculcated a kind of free market orientation in a lot of things. And eventually I started reading National Review as well. And, uh, and um, some of that social conservatism um, took. So I was already pretty conservative um, by the time I came to Princeton and then I um, wrote for and eventually edited a conservative paper on campus and and was part of a, a speakers group that brought people to campus um, and, uh, and met a lot of people that way, um, including the then editor of National Review, John O'Sullivan, um, who uh, suggested that I apply for an internship, um, which I did. Um, and I, I did that internship the summer after my junior year. And um, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, by the time I was uh, being graduated in 1995, way back in the last millennium, um, the magazine was starting a DC bureau and the Republicans had just taken Congress. And so while I had applied to a bunch of law schools, I wasn't especially eager to go in the fall. And so I deferred while I covered this new Republican Congress, the first time there'd been one for 40 years, and the presidential race of 1996. And I liked it enough that I just, I stayed. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a long road since then. And I'm, I'm sure you can recognize now that Princeton has definitely changed since your, your time here. Um, what are your thoughts on like the sort of the intellectual environment at colleges and universities now with a lot of social justice minded perspectives um, refusing or like avoiding debate on certain issues because of the issue of human rights being disputed or the, the fact that there's like no shared moral values. Do you find that any debate has to have some sort of understanding on what both sides can agree on before even beginning? Can like someone who believes in a theocracy have a like a valuable argument with someone who's a, a democratic or like a republic minded individual? Like, is, is there some basis that we need to have before we have debates? So I'd say that the campus intellectual climate uh, sort of changed and then changed back. Um, so a lot of the debates that we're having are very similar to the debates we had in the early 1990s, just under slightly different terms um, with you know, for political correctness having been replaced by cancel culture and wokeness. Um, obviously there are some differences now. Um, the political correctness phenomenon was thought of and I think largely was confined to campuses. Whereas what we're talking about now is I think a broader, a set of attitudes that has broader purchase in our culture that may have sort of started or originated or found its focal point on campuses, um, but has influenced 
quite far beyond it. it has influence in corporate America of a sort that it didn't have in the early 1990s, for example. Um, as for sort of the starting premises that you have to have in order to have an argument, I suppose it just depends on um, sort of the type of argument that you're having. Having, I mean, I'm, you know, look, if foundational arguments between advocates of democracy and opponents of it um, have happened and have been influential. Um, you know, obviously, you're sort of um, uh, they're they're just different, right? From an argument where you know everybody agrees on ninety percent of things, and they're basically trying to figure out whether that ninety percent um, implies that one of them is is right or has a superior view of the remaining ten percent or part of the remaining ten percent, or maybe you know sort of implied by that ninety percent plus some contingent facts about the world. Um, that have turned up or that we disagree about, um, you know, and and it does feel as though uh, we are often these days, you know, and these things sort of wax and wane, right? Uh, and it does feel as though the arguments of say the 1990s in Washington D.C. Um, were a little bit narrower and had more um, agreed assumptions than some of the arguments that we have today. All right, so like. From your your knowledge of history, would you say it's kind of a a rhyme in, in terms of like what we're experiencing now and, and the time in the 1990s, or would you say it's it's getting worse, or is it just a cycle? Do you think? Well, um, I think that some of the habits of mind that we described under the term political correctness were were wrongheaded, unproductive poisonous in some of the same ways that um, these attitudes were, that, that today's attitudes um, are. It's worse insofar as they're more influential, but I also think that they are, they're sort of piggybacking on a broader trend toward polarization um, in our society and uh, an increase in mistrust and um, uh, an unwillingness to to extend um, charitable assumptions uh, to one another. Um, so that sort of that broader context seems to me to be quite a bit worse um, than what we'd had in the past. Right, and I guess one of the things that makes it worse in the '90s is probably tech and and that sort of that space, which has kind of dominated debate and. You've yeah. kind of seen these like media bubbles and little content streams being curated for the for each individual, which does not is not conducive to debate. So, like, do you how does your publication, the National Review, how does that how do you guys try to combat that and get to different audiences that are probably narrowed down into a content stream of just like the Matto Show or MSNBC? How do you try to get your ideas past um, your certain audience? Yeah, well, that, you know, that's uh, an interesting question. So primarily, you know, when I write an article or a post, I know that it's, it's going to be read by conservatives and libertarians. Um, but I, you know, want to sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll write more provocatively than at other times. Um, but I want to be able to persuade those who don't agree with me or who are not on the right um, so that they'll, um, if, not, if not come around to my point of view, at least see that it is a reasonable point of view, that a reasonable person of goodwill can hold that view. Um, if somebody sort of goes from uh, disagreeing and, and thinking the view is sort of crazy or absurd, um, to still disagreeing, but not thinking that, uh, that it seems to me is, is a win. Um, you know, it's not, not every writer um, writes that way. Uh, and sometimes it can be enjoyable to read people who are not writing um, in an attempt to engage in that kind of persuasion, but I do think it's, it's, it's important. Um, I think it's important for you know, my colleagues to read and be exposed to uh, 
um, thoughts from outside the conservative world, which you know I think everybody does. I mean, it's not like we need to have a directive um, for that to happen. Um, just so that our own thinking gets sharper, um, and uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes you end up just being wrong about something. Sometimes you're fundamentally right, but a particular argument you're making is is flabby, um, needs to be modified or or abandoned. Um, and so, really, you know, for for my colleagues and for just really everybody, I suggest um, first and foremost. Uh, reading and being exposed to different points of view. And then the other thing is uh, uh, the a practice of intellectual charity, which I'm you know, certainly not holding myself out as an exemplar in that respect, but I do think it is, it is helpful um, to always try to think through uh, or imagine um, why, again, somebody who uh, uh, is, intelligent and has goodwill might reach this conclusion that is different from yours or that is unfamiliar to you. Right. That's and a real effort. I mean, it's an effort that I yeah. think that, that people don't, it, it's, it's easy not to, to go into. Sure. And it's, like, it's very tempting with the way we get our news now with, with Twitter being, you, you pick who comes onto your, your stream and who like who you see in your feed. And I guess like that's kind of conducive to a, a lot of other things, like something that's been floated around is disinformation. And there's also um, a lot of policing of information with the fear of disinformation being spread. Um, we saw that with the 2020 election with theories about voter fraud and the sort. Um, so like, I, I guess from, from your political principles, how do you think a tech company or if a tech company should combat these uh, forces that are kind of lurking around social media, do you think that it runs a risk with in terms of intent, intellectual debate? Are there like trade-offs that need to be made? Yeah. Like what, what are your, what would your principles say about a tech company's responsibility in, in regulating that? So um, before talking about the tech companies in particular, I would just say that in general, our arguments about kind of a culture of free speech and, um, you know, who should be invited to speak, who should be disinvited, uh, um, who should be boycotted, all of those things. Um, we err in thinking that these are questions of hard and fast principle um, when they're really questions of disposition uh, and of, uh, of virtues, of intellectual virtues uh, and moral virtues. Um, uh, in particular, the virtue of the virtues of tolerance and charity. And so, you know, the uh, an attempt to sort of lay out a, a kind of strong or absolute principle of uh, uh, tolerance is going to founder ultimately on, you know, the sort of uh, reductio ad absurdum, well, what about a Nazi? And the fact is, you know, you're not obliged morally to, to tolerate, um, you know, you, you don't have to bring a Nazi to speak on campus. Um, you know, you, you are not obligated as an editor to, um, to let a communist, uh, you know, an advocate of a dictatorship of the proletariat uh, have a column. Um, so, but, but what, but the disposition, I think, that we should be guarding and cultivating is disposition um, toward tolerance, uh, and it's and that and figuring out the boundaries requires, I think, judgment rather than sort of deduction from a set of first principles. And that's sort of really why I, I come back to the, the thing I was saying earlier about um, trying to see, trying to imagine, and, and trying to trying hard to, to think through how uh, an intelligent person of goodwill could hold a different view from yours. Um, and so it seems to me that on any of the major controverted questions of our own day um, in our, our own culture and politics, people on all sides of them can pass that test and should be heard out. Um, they should be challenged to offer reasons uh, and to rebut better or contrary reasons that are that are put forward against them, um, but that but the line shifts over time. 
right? In um, 1957, um, a person who had been brought up in, uh, in the, the culture of the white South, um, who was not you know, a vicious person, a person of, of bad character, could and did, many people did hold segregationist views. Um, uh, whereas today, some, you know, if, if you were to advocate such views, it would be a mark of bad character and it would be the sort of thing that could reasonably be shunned. And I think some people have a hard time with the fact that these lines shift um, with, they want it to be um, a more kind of deductive enterprise than it actually is. And that's, and then, and then you get sort of on the other side, well, there's no such thing as cancel culture. Um, because everybody is in favor of drawing a line somewhere. They'll say, well, well no, it just means that cancel culture is not, um, is not uh, usefully defined um, in terms of sort of an on or off switch about a principle. It's, it's more usefully defined in terms of um, how, how uh, open-minded uh, are you and how tolerant are you prepared to be? Right, so you, you would say that your concern with regulation of speech on, on social media is more of a... Oh, I'm sorry, a, so I never got around to your question yeah, about yeah. big tech. So, um, so, I mean, I think they too should, uh, should err on the side of, uh, of latitude, um, uh, particularly when it comes to the expression of different viewpoints. Uh, and... Uh, and I, I am I am less concerned about um, the propagation of false information or misleading um, stories on social media than I am uh, by the potential suppression of truthful or arguable um, points of view. And I think we're seeing a good example um, this week. Uh, in the discussion about the lab leak hypothesis um, with respect to the origins of the COVID-19 virus, where you had a kind of um, mistaken certitude about um, the you know, extreme unlikelihood or impossibility even of the lab leak theory that um, tech companies acted on. And now it's being revised and people are seeing, well, you know, there was a sort of element of groupthink that was at work there um, and, and, and an element of sort of reflexive um, reactivity against President Trump and, uh, and some of his allies rather than a careful and dispassionate examination of the evidence. Um, that it seems to me is, is uh, something that you really want to avoid. Um, and so in particular, when it comes to the expression of ideas or the presentation of facts, uh, I would suggest that the tech companies try internally to follow, a, to act as though the First Amendment governed them. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think, yeah, like I, I think tech companies are, are walking a really thin line here in terms of what they should what, what is potentially a, a threat and what is not. And, and I guess in the, they're, they're prioritizing safety and security over a lot of, uh, I guess, free expression and a lot of the hallmarks of what people consider democratic. Um, well, and safety and security, uh, particularly when it comes to speech are being defined in, in expansive ways. Right, right. Um, and so I kind of want to shift to a different um, area that's within your purview. I think domestic policy is something you've written a lot about. Um, and I guess one thing that's sort of come up in recent months is the uh, child tax credit and the fact that people are starting to recognize that it is really hard to raise a family in America. And um, it's especially with the financial burdens that are placed on, on mothers and fathers in this country. And, and, and conservatives are, are coming to the defense of a child tax credit. Mitt Romney notably proposed a massive child tax credit. And a lot of conservatives who are, I guess, pro-natalists see this as a, a big boon for the family and potentially a, a way to spark growth economically and also culturally. Um, so would you give like a short pitch of what, why 
the um, the child tax credit is so important and why having the American family revitalized is both important to the conservative tradition and also um, good for our economy and our culture of innovation. Sure. So yeah, I have been an advocate of uh, an expanded child credit for a good 15, 16 years now. And um, the basic argument is that uh, parental investment in children is something that uh, existing government policy gives too short a shrift to. Um, there are different streams of advocacy for the child credit. Um, uh, some people are moved mostly by the fact that it would really dramatically reduce child poverty. Um, others, as you were alluding to, are really concerned about the birth rates. Uh, and my view is, is, is simply a matter of the fact that the federal government's priorities have been unbalanced toward the elderly uh, and away from children. Um, I share the concern that people have about birth rates, uh, although even there, there's a sort of a distinction. Um, my view isn't that we need to have a bigger child tax credit in order to encourage people to have children, so much as it is um, that we have for quite a while in the US had smaller family sizes than people have tended to indicate in surveys that they want. Uh, when, you know, when surveys of sort of ideal family size or intended family size, how many children you would like to have end up being lower um, than the number that you have. And there's, I'm sure, all kinds of explanations, all kinds of things go into that. Uh, but uh, I think part of it is an economic uh, issue. Um, and to the extent that we can, we can address that economic concern uh, through policy, we can. I don't think it's just a matter of child credit. I think also we need to increase housing supply to make housing more affordable by deregulating it. Um, I think there's stuff that we should be doing on higher education, on um, job mobility, on all kinds of things. But I do think part of the explanation is the child credit. Sometimes uh, when you make this argument, you'll run into people who, are, who will say, who will act as though you're trying to kind of reverse the industrial revolution and go back to a kind of pre-industrial or agrarian family size. Look, there's all kinds of reasons for not thinking that we would will have those kinds of birth rates, right? I mean, when infant mortality drops, um, people don't have as many kids. That's not a bad thing. When um, when kids are not um, as useful to most parents as farm laborers. Uh, and instead it takes um, an extended period of educational investment um, for them to have a role in the economy. Um, you know, that, that also changes things. Um, so, but I do think that on the margin, uh, we can make a difference. And, and partly it's, it's simply a matter of this being a very important part of happiness and fulfillment. Um, for most people, and if there are obstacles that are that are keeping that from happening, um, then let's take those seriously. So you're you're emphasizing kind of the the quality of life aspect of this more than say the birth rates, which you acknowledge can help in the economy, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, it's true, right? That um, that it's going to be harder to address these the pension solvency issue um, with low and falling birth rates. It's true that um, it's probably gonna harm our, us geopolitically um, if our population starts shrinking. Um, but it does seem to me that A, it's, you know, sort of people just don't have kids for uh, the good of the, their country, frankly, or let alone for the good of their pensions. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also just true that the, you know, the, that the happiness of our population ought to matter to us. Right. And yeah, I mean, I guess there's broad agreement on that in terms of left and right people have from both sides of the aisle have, have come together. So hopefully that gets passed. I'm, I'm also a supporter of that, <laughs> that, uh, that proposal. Um, and also, I guess, another aspect of domestic policy that you've spoken a lot about is Roe v. Wade and the potential of that changing. So I kind of want to 
allow you to summarize your argument of sure as what as to why Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided and like constitutionally like what what are the flaws with Roe v. Wade and and also just give a I guess your thoughts on the chances of it being overturned based sure. on the, the current court composition and the beliefs of each justice. Right. So so Roe v. Wade um, is a is a notoriously poor decision. Um, from the very beginning, even legal scholars who were sympathetic to the policy conclusion that abortion should be generally legal um, thought that uh, it was poorly grounded in the Constitution, um, or, or if they thought you could read the Constitution to imply a right to abortion, that it would have to be done in some other way than Roe actually did it, um, that the reasoning in, in Justice Blackmun's opinion uh, wasn't particularly strong. And so an academic cottage industry really arose in the years subsequent to it where they were trying to find better constitutional lodging for the right to abortion. I think that uh, those efforts have, have largely failed. And so uh, the, the question of whether the constitution sort of rightly understood as an original matter uh, in, protects abortion from regulation by governments, uh, it, it's, it's, it, that, that it's hard to sustain. Uh, and really what sustains Roe now is its precedential force, but you know, the text of the constitution, the history, the original understanding, the structure, um, the history of government practice, uh, all of it suggests that uh, at the very least, governments may prohibit abortion in the interest of protecting unborn human life, which, you know, full disclosure, that's what I believe. I believe that, uh, that it is a basic requirement of justice um, that unborn children have the same protections against legal homicide that all other human beings are supposed to have. Uh, whether Roe goes now, I think really depends on a number of things. One being what the justices think about its presidential force. Uh, and then another being what they think about the political and institutional implications of overturning it. Um, it's often suggested that the court's legitimacy uh, or its reputation really um, rests on its uh, sticking with this precedent. I think that the precedent is, is less stable than it appears. On the one hand, it is true that since Roe, all the way back in 1973, the court has consistently held that um, prohibiting abortion uh, is unconstitutional. But it's done a lot of shifting around in terms of its rationale for that. Um, Casey v. Planned Parenthood in 1992 really substantially changed the intellectual underpinnings of Roe. And then the first big case following um, Casey, the authors of the Casey plurality themselves didn't agree on what it meant. They didn't agree in the 2000 case about whether that meant partial birth abortion could be banned or, or couldn't be banned. And then seven years later, they reversed themselves on that. Arguably the, uh, uh, the whole women's health case in 2015 revises Casey. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is a stable body of law that has been capable of providing uh, real guidance to state legislatures. I mean, when you say um, you can regulate abortion but you can't put an undue burden on the rights, you're not really answering the question. Uh, as just the late Justice Scalia pointed out, you know what counts as an undue burden is a, is a pretty subjective question. You're not going to find an actual answer to that in the Constitution, which is not surprising since the Constitution doesn't really purport to lay out a detailed set of, of rules for what you can and can't do with respect to abortion. Um, so I think it's possible that the court either narrows, uh, either overrules Roe, uh, and its successor cases, or narrows it as a prelude to eventually striking it down. And I think that that is what the court should do. So I guess your your opposition to the logic within the the Blackman argument is that the due process part of Roe v. Wade is sort of wrongly characterized from the Constitution. Is is that 
Does that sound about right to you? Wow, there there, there is there is so much wrong um, with Roe. I mean, there is a, there is a set of historical assertions about 19th century abortion law in the U.S. that have been discredited since Roe, for example, which actually happens to have been the subject of my senior thesis um, <laughs> when I was at Princeton. Uh, but the so I guess the two fundamental parts of one would be um, this argument that that the due process clause somehow includes abortion, like it protects abortion, which I think it's, is um, unsustainable. But, uh, but even the other part of Blackman's argument that uh, tends to get less um, critical scrutiny, uh, the part where he dismisses the idea that uh, unborn children are persons, um, is very shaky. It, it, uh, the, the argument actually is not, uh, is not particularly robust. So for example, he says that most refer that the references to person in the, that are in the constitution don't have prenatal application. Um, well, yeah. So you know, when the, when the, um, when the constitution refers to extradition for, of persons from one state to another, it clearly doesn't have unborn children in mind. It doesn't have toddlers in mind either, right? But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean um, that they're not entitled to any legal protections, uh, you know, and that they have to be excluded from the category of persons for all purposes of law. Um, it's, just, it's just a non sequitur uh, in Blackman's argument. Um, so I just... Uh, it's it is just a a thoroughly badly reasoned decision. So it, it like across the board, you, you think that the historical underpinnings of of Roe is, are also false. Um, and I guess like Roe has been kind of a rallying cry for conservatism, especially social conservatism in the last fifty or so years. Um, and I mean, it's produced a lot of intellectuals, thinkers, politicians, and um, I, I guess recently that, that sort of social conservatism has taken a, a backseat towards a more populist um, sort of rhetoric that's obviously mm -hmm. taken over the Re Republican Party with Donald Trump ascending to the presidency. So like, how have you seen this like sort of clash between traditional social conservatism and like the newer, I guess, it's more akin to paleo conservatism more than anything, I think. How do you see how do you see that at the National Review and conservative circles? So one thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, I think we've clearly seen a decline in um, traditional religious belief and affiliation. Um, and you know, for those of us who are who are pro-life or anti-abortion, you know, it's always the, the claim has always been, you know, we're trying to uh, it's push our religious beliefs on everybody and you know that, that what we're doing is is in some way theocratic but what what's interesting is that public attitudes on abortion haven't really changed even as religious belief and religious um, practice have waned um, which I think is a testament to um, the fact that the uh, the fundamental argument for a right to life is not especially theological um, that that it is something that is accessible to reason um, and relies on biological facts um, rather than uh, the teachings of churches or the authority of churches and theological matters. Um, the shift that we're seeing on the right, um, therefore, has an uh, it included being less religious, but not being particularly less pro-life. Um, the, the Republican Party uh, and the conservative side of American politics is at least as pro-life as it's ever been, um, and arguably more so just as on the, the other side, there is a, a, there's increased uniformity uh, among Democrats and progressives in favoring legal uh, and taxpayer-funded abortion. Um, where I think the right has been more likely to shift, well, there's been two, some social issues, just sort of the, the facts on the ground have changed, right? So same-sex marriage uh, being a, a, one example of that. Um, 
uh, but the, but again, abortion, which has been the most salient of the social issues for so long, really the, the politics of that have fundamentally not changed. Uh, and then the other thing that has changed on the right more, I think, than the social issues is the economic issues. Um, that there is um, uh, there is much less concern for uh, limited government uh, and free markets. Um, than there once was, and that's a matter of degree. It's uh, it's not like that has vanished by any means from the conservative worldview. Uh, but but I mean, if you think back to what the way President Trump campaigned in 2015 and 2016, he broke with the Republican Party orthodoxy on trade, on health care, on entitlements, um, on the social issues, you know, right to life, right to guns, those sorts of things. Um, he was cunning or canny enough to know that he needed to reverse himself. Um, his historic views on those issues needed to flip um, rather than the party as a whole. That, you know, he wouldn't, you know, people always would always say, well, he can, you know, he can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. I guess that, that was originally something he observed about himself. Yeah, but he couldn't flip on um, the Supreme Court uh, or, um, uh, the right to life, and there were just there were just a handful of things that he he couldn't uh, switch on, which were really important to millions and millions of conservative voters, and all this other stuff. You know, most most people just don't have strong views about trade policy. I mean, I have strong views about trade policy, but I'm unusual. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say that like your your characterization of the economic shift of the Republican Party is really interesting. So you would say that the, the Republican Party as a whole has shifted leftward on these issues in terms of the economic left-right axis, right? I would say that the, the Republicans are not quite sure what they stand for right now, um, that, that Trump sort of blew up a previous consensus without really replacing it um, with anything else. And part of what happened was there was a kind of uh, increasing dogmatism uh, a kind of calcification of the party's economic ideology under the influence of the Tea Party and in reaction to Obama. Uh, and Trump undid that. But if you look at the historical record of the Republican Party, even the Reagan, George W. Bush Party, it was not uh, a single mindedly you know, economic libertarian party. Reagan imposed some tariffs, George W. Bush started a new entitlement and posted a tariff on his, of his own. Um, and, and sometimes there is a kind of uh, tendency to think of the Republican party, party circa 2012 as though that was the entirety of the historical tradition of conservatism uh, when, it, uh, when it really wasn't. Um, that actually, that mistake in a way was, was part of what Trump was able to exploit to become the leader of the party. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I'd also like to add, maybe we get your thoughts on this, like the idea that Trump's conservatism kind of mirrors an earlier form, like maybe in the earlier 20th century with a more isolationist idea in terms mm -hmm. of like foreign policy, while also keeping a lot of social conservative issues like mainly intact in, with the party's platform. How, how do you think Trump's conservatism kind of mirrors I'd say maybe like the one, the conservatism of like Calvin Coolidge, for example. Yeah, so to the extent that you can sort of impose coherence on Trumpism, um, it would be by drawing a line from, uh, yeah, let's say Coolidge to Robert Taft, uh, to Patrick Buchanan on to Trump. Um, but, you know, Trump himself was not all that, uh, consistent, hasn't been all that consistent, hasn't been all that um, philosophically oriented, let's say, or even policy oriented. Um, one interesting thing, I think one really telling point about all this is that, I mean, you know, so, so Pat Buchanan, uh, he had some famous quote after Trump won the nomination, or maybe after he won the presidency, I think he told Tim Alberta when he was at Politico, something like, um, I didn't win, but my ideas won. Uh, well, really? It seemed to me that you spent much of the 90s and afterwards obsessed with Israel, and your point of view did not at all win in the Republican Party the, the, and the Trump administration, which was extremely uh, 
pro-Israel, which you know was pro-Israel in a way that previous Republican administrations were not willing to be. This did not seem to be a small issue to the paleo or Buchananite right um, beforehand. Now, arguably, taking that sort of paleo line on uh, Israel um, would have been more consistent with other things that Trump said and did and other impulses that he reflected, but also arguably would have kept him from getting the nomination in the first place. Um, that that would have been one of those red lines um, that he couldn't cross. Uh, and so um, th that's just sort of one area where the, uh, uh, the attempt to kind of make a coherent philosophy out of Trump's impulses or Trump's political strategy, uh, I think doesn't quite work. Right, that makes sense. I guess there's a lot of limitations with yeah, you know, the paleo tendency, like yeah. so, you know, Robert Taft, I think would have been would have been eager to carve into Medicare, you know, <laughs> right. um, in a, in a way that Trump wasn't. Right, and yeah, so I guess like you've been, we've kind of talked about Trump as a phenomena, but you've been opposed to him notoriously, I guess, um, as as a writer and as a thinker on the conservative side of things. Um, so. What was that experience like at like the National Review? Was that like a something that you faced a lot of backlash for? Is it kind of evenly split in terms of never Trumpers and like Trump conservatives? Like how has that been intellectually? Yeah, there's been a range of responses uh, to Trump at National Review. Um, before the 2020 election, we ran a, a little symposium. We had three of our writers, you know, make the case for different um, choices in the election. Uh, and I was uh, the person who said, don't vote for Trump, um, made that argument. It's, uh, and you get, you know, you, you certainly um, get a lot of blowback, uh, a lot of criticism from uh, people, including people who used to be allies and, uh, and friends, um, because you didn't go along with Trump or you're seen as too critical of, of Trump or there are particular things with respect to Trump um, where you stake out, a, where I stuck, staked out a position. I was for both impeachments, for example, and against, uh, against voting for him in either 2016 or 2020. But you also sometimes will get the um, uh, response from people who are further to your left uh, that you're not anti-Trump enough, you're, you know, because I also argued against voting for Biden. I, I said conservatives shouldn't vote for Biden. I, I said it would be better to keep a Republican Congress to maintain Republican strength in the Congress than to have a kind of wipeout. Um, and you know, so you do uh, have a certain loneliness uh, in the in the position um, that you take. But you know, we were never promised that uh, that. That everything would be smooth sailing. So I guess just for our listeners who aren't too familiar with your your writings about Trump, you'd say you're mostly opposed to him on on moral and philosophical grounds, like on his on his character and fitness for office, or is it the policies? Because I guess a lot of conservatives have been sort of surprised with how how well he's stuck to Republican priorities in terms of getting the tax right. cuts done. Um, I guess appointing justices that are very conservative and lean towards um, opposing Roe v. Wade. So like, yeah, where does so your opposition start? Yeah, there were There were different grounds for conservative skepticism or opposition to him in 2016. You know, uh, there were the people who just thought he was a sure loser uh, and opposed his nomination for that reason. And they just turned out to be wrong. Um, and, you know, I shouldn't just say they, we turned out to be wrong uh, about that. Um, there were the people who thought he would not be reliably conservative, uh, even on the issues where he was saying that he would be conservative on. So he wouldn't be reliable on judges um, and uh, guns and so on and so forth, taxes. And um, aside from some rhetorical feints, he, he disproved that too. And that's one reason why uh, conservative opposition was so much smaller in 2020 than it was in 2016. Uh, but for me, the fundamental problem was always, oh, I see, and then there's the people who just disagreed with him on some particular issues where, you know, I mean, there's a current of thought in American conservative 
conservatism historically is protectionist. I wouldn't say it's so unconservative to be a protectionist. I just think it's mistaken. I disagreed with him on that. But that wouldn't have been enough, I think, to um, to to keep me from voting for him uh, over either Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. But fundamentally, um, my objection to him was one that was, I think, not disproven uh, and was actually vindicated, and that it was the, the fitness for office thing, that he had a set of traits um, that uh, that made him a negative influence, a very negative influence on our political culture, and that um, made him uh, a poor fit for the job of commander in chief. And then there are these things that are sort of the intersection of character and policy. Um, so, you know, I disagree with them on trade, fine. Um, I disagree with them on some aspects of immigration. Too. Uh, but the particular blend of callousness and incompetence that led to the family separation policy, um, that I think reflects not just kind of a mistaken policy, but just fundamental defects of character. And it led to a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, the unbelievable subordination of the national interest of of any cause with which he'd been associated to his own ego needs, um, you know, which is something I suppose is true of many politicians, but was just present to a pathological degree in him, I think really bore fruit in the post-election campaign uh, of deception uh, and, and lunacy. Um, you know, where this claims that he'd won and won big, um, I think it was very destructive uh, and remains very destructive for our politics. Um, so there have been many things, there were many things during the course of the Trump administration that I thought, uh, where I thought he made good decisions uh, or he ended up in the right place. And I said so, and I defended him from criticisms that I thought were mistaken. Uh, and there were some times that I was very pleasantly surprised by outcomes, but there really wasn't any time where I regretted um, not having voted for him. And I, I guess that's like, especially makes sense in hindsight because of the events of January 6th and where he left office, like in terms of the political environment. And so I guess with our interview coming to a close, um, we typically ask our, our guests what their punchline is in terms of policy recommendations, or it could even be just a little soapbox talk. So um, what is your um, punchline for our listeners? I'm tempted to say that the punchline is that there is no punchline because the world is a, is a complex place uh, and can't be reduced to slogans and formulae. Uh, but in a way that is really my punchline because I think that is what, um, what conservatism rightly understood has to amount to. It's a politics of reality, of facing reality, incorporating it uh, in, and working with it as opposed to trying to kind of uh, reconstruct it according to an abstract mold. Um, and I think that the sort of conspiracy theory cast of mind um, that we have become more accustomed to seeing in our politics on the right, but also on the left, has in common something with uh, the ideological frame of uh, uh, political thinking. And that is that it's a failure to uh, to take the world on on its own terms, um, that and that failure um, is uh, is likely to have all kinds of bad consequences, and we're, we're we see that in, in lots of different ways in many corners of our politics. And so the conservatism and the liberalism that I would recommend is uh, a conservatism and liberalism um, that takes the sort of the given facts of human existence as their starting point. And so on that note, um, I'd like to thank Ramesh for coming on our show. Um, it's always good to have an alum back speaking with us. Um, and I encourage our listeners to check his work out at Bloomberg and the National Review. Also, you can follow him at Twitter on Twitter at Ramesh Panuru. Um, thank you so much, Ramesh. And uh, thanks to our listeners.
You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.